Hi everyone, my name is Faustine Ramirez and I'm a master tutor with Med School Coach. And today we'll be reviewing a Step 2 CK OB question. So let's start by reading the stem and pay attention because we will have to move on to the next slide and I'd like you to work on um, approaching this question on your own first before we discuss it together. So let's read the stem first. A 25 year old primogravid woman at 39 weeks gestation is admitted to the hospital in labor. She had spontaneous rupture of membranes 24 hours ago. She reports good fetal movement and regular painful uterine contractions. Temperature is 38.6 Celsius, heart rate is 116, respiratory rate is 22, and blood pressure is 98 over 67. Respirations are mildly labored and lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. There is pronounced tenderness to palpation over the uterine fundus. No cost over T roll angle tenderness is noted. The cervix is four centimeters dilated and 70% effaced, and the vertex is at negative two station. Laboratory studies reveal a serum leukocyte count of 18,500 with a left shift. Microscopic examination of a clean catch urine specimen shows no leukocytes or bacteria. The fetal heart tracing is shown here in red. So pause the video, make sure you have gathered this information before we move on to the next slide. All right, so let's take a look at the fetal heart tracing, which is shown here in red. And the question is, which of the following is the most likely cause of this fetal heart tracing? So now I'd like you to pause the video and try to select your best answer, and then we'll approach the question together. All right, welcome back. So let's approach this question together. So as always, when we approach the question, the first step will be to read the actual question itself. So the very last sentence of the stem. And here it's asking us which of the following is the most likely cause of this fetal heart tracing. So this is going to be a question about an underlying diagnosis or etiology of the findings. And we glance at the answer choices as our next step and we very briefly, just in a few seconds, see that they all involve either um, some cause of abnormal heart tracing or some um, form of infection. And so we'll have to keep an open mind as we're reading the stem because these are not specifically in one category of responses. And so then we'll read from the top and we'll highlight the key elements. So 25 year old primogravid woman at 39 weeks gestation admitted to the hospital in labor. She had spontaneous rupture of membranes 24 hours ago. She reports good fetal movement and regular painful uterine contractions. Temperature is 38.6 Celsius, heart rate is 116, respiratory rate is 22, and blood pressure is 98 over 67. I do recommend highlighting the abnormal vital signs. So here uh, the patient has a fever, is tachycardic, some mild tachypnea, the blood pressure is still in the normal range, slightly lower end of normal, but still normal. Respirations are mildly labored and lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. So remember that in pregnancy, um, pregnant women have a slight amount of dyspnea and increased respiratory rate, and that is physiologic um, in the state of pregnancy, and she's in labor. So this is not altogether an abnormal finding to have a woman in labor who is pregnant to have um, slightly increased respiratory rate, especially in the setting of a fever. Um, and her lungs are clear, so we're not concerned here about um, an pulmonal intra um, lung pathology or a pulmonologic cause of her fevers or her current presentation. There is pronounced tenderness to palpation over the uterine fundus. No cost over t angle tenderness is noted, and I think it's important to highlight not just the pertinent positives, but the pertinent negatives, which can help us when we're trying to eliminate answer choices. The cervix is four centimeters dilated and 70% effaced, and the vertex is at negative two station. Laboratory studies reveal a serum leukocyte count of 18,500 with a left shift. I also do recommend highlighting any abnormal labs or studies that you're given. Microscopic examination of a clean catch urine specimen shows no leukocytes or bacteria. So again, this is an example of a pertinent negative that's going to help us eliminate um, an answer choice. Then we have a fetal heart tracing as shown here in red. So before we move on to the fetal heart tracing, Let's take a moment to look at some key elements that um, are going to help us narrow down the answer choices. So for these long questions, I really recommend either um, pausing and either jotting down a few things on your scrap piece of paper or just going through these findings in your mind and just um, pulling apart kind of the main specific findings of the presentation. And so let's do an example of that together here. 
So this is a patient who is at term, who's in labor, and um, right based on what we're told, right, there's nothing abnormal about um, her progression of labor, right? She's having regular contractions, she's making cervical change um, that is appropriate, um, and so there are no, and she's at term here. So she's presenting in labor at term, no concerns there in terms of her progression of labor. However, she is having a fever with tachycardia, and those go hand in hand. And she has pronounced tenderness to palpation over the uterine fundus, so she has uterine tenderness. And she has a leukocytosis. So even without looking at the fetal heart tracing, we can actually make a diagnosis just based on these findings. But if you're, not, you're still unsure just based on these findings, we can take a look at the heart tracing and it's gonna give us more information. Um, a few pertinent negatives to point out here are that there is no CVA tenderness and there is no um, pyuria or bacteria. And so for a woman um, in labor with a fever, um, there are a few things in our differential and one of them we can certainly rule out based on these findings. So the absence of CVA tenderness and the absence of pyuria and bacteria um, is sufficient to rule out a urinary tract infection or pyelonephritis as the cause of her fever. So this is really helpful and is gonna help us eliminate one of the answer choices. Now, let's take a look at this fetal heart tracing to supplement um, this constellation of findings that we have here. So remember, fever, uterine tenderness, and um, leukocytosis. And another thing that we should pay attention to when we're thinking about infection is um, the rupture of membranes. And so here we're told the rupture of membranes is 24 hours, okay? And so that's really important. Now, you may remember from OB that there's a certain threshold we use before we say that there's prolonged rupture of membranes. And so this is a really crucial threshold to remember. If it's above 18 hours, it's considered prolonged. And you must remember this number. This is going to show up on your shelf and it's going to be important to be able to answer certain questions correctly. It's going to be a piece of information that you have to incorporate when you synthesize the findings. So this woman ruptured 24 hours ago and so she also has prolonged ruptured of membranes. All right, so let's take a look at this fetal heart tracing. So this question is actually, um, you're able to answer it without even looking at the fetal heart tracing like I mentioned, but it's really here because students find it hard to interpret fetal heart tracings. And um, whenever they see this, they develop a lot of anxiety and they start trying to, try to remember all the different causes of decelerations and accelerations and what is normal and what is abnormal and what's on my differential for different types of decelerations. And so they get, um, they get anxious and they forget to focus on the fact that they could answer this question without even looking at it. But while we're here, let's take a moment to learn about how to interpret this fetal heart tracing. So remember that a normal fetal heart rate is between 110 and 160. So above 160, we're in the fetal tachycardia range. We're also looking for accelerations, um, which are a sign of a reactive fetal heart tracing. And we're also looking for decelerations that could be concerning. And we're looking at the variability. Now, this fetal heart tracing is a little bit small, so you might not be able to see all the details, but ultimately the main takeaway from this fetal heart tracing, the first thing I want you to do is to look at the heart rate. And if we look at the heart rate, we, we're told that it's the red one, and we look and we see that it's actually somewhere between 190 to 210. And there's some variability here. Um, and so that's, um, I would say, kind of a, a moderate, it's an appropriate amount of variability but it's an appropriate amount of variability in the 190 to 210 range, which is much higher than the normal. So the normal is 110 to 160. And so even, this is actually not going to be a question at all about decelerations, even though you might be thinking that when you see the fetal heart tracing. This is a question about your just ability to simply look at and interpret the fetal heart rate on a fetal heart tracing. So first step, when you get a fetal heart tracing, look at the heart rate. Normal should be kind of in this 110 to 160 range. It should be somewhere in here in this gray zone. And we see that it's well above that. And so um, this is a relatively straightforward uh, fetal heart tracing that simply shows us fetal tachycardia. And there's not much else to it 
besides just looking at that heart rate and seeing that it's fetal tachycardia. Now in other fetal heart tracings, um, you might be looking for decelerations and that's the subject of um, a different talk and a different question. We don't have time to get into that there. And um, if you want to review your um, different types of decelerations now is a great time. Um, however, we don't have time for that in this question. So this, the interpretation of this is simply fetal tachycardia. So really important to look at the heart rate to know what the normal range is. And if it's above that, um, that should clue you into fetal tachycardia. Now, what are some things that can cause fetal tachycardia? You can get fetal tachycardia when there's fetal distress. You can get fetal tachycardia when there's fetal anemia. Um, you can get tachycardia when there is um, an infection um, going on in the mother. Um, and so it's, although it's relatively nonspecific, it could be seen in a lot of different things in this constellation of findings that we discussed. Um, it's another clue as to what's going on. So if we were to summarize, um, this is a mother with um, prolonged rupture of membranes, fever, uterine tenderness, leukocytosis, and now this additional finding of fetal tachycardia. So that constellation of findings is a slam dunk for one of these diagnoses. Do you know which one it is? So the correct answer is E, chorioamunitis. So that constellation of findings is a slam dunk. And all these other answer choices, let's go through and see why some of them are wrong. So answer choice A, uteroplacental insufficiency. This is the cause of um, when we have late decelerations on a fetal heart tracing. Again, this is here as a distractor um, because of this fetal heart tracing. Actually, it doesn't have, um, it's not a question about deceleration, so we can cross that one off. Fetal anemia. Certainly fetal anemia could cause tachycardia, but in the presence of all these other findings, um, chorioamunitis is much more likely and is the best explanation for the fetal tachycardia. There's no reason for us to suspect fetal anemia, and we have another alternative, more plausible explanation, so we can cross that one off. Pyelonephritis. Now, in a mother presenting with fever, leukocytosis, abdominal tenderness, um, certainly we could think of pylo, it'll be on our differential, but the absence of CVA tenderness and the absence of pyuria and bacteria in the urine allows us to eliminate this as a potential answer choice. Oligohydramnios would be seen with um, variable decelerations, uh, but here we just have tachycardia. Um, and then we answer choice F, umbilical cord compression, also seen in variable decelerations. And answer choice G, fetal head compression is seen in early decelerations. So ultimately, all these answer, most of these answer choices were here to trick you um, and to make you fret about not being able to interpret different types of decelerations on a fetal heart tracing when really this was just fetal tachycardia. So let's review this very high yield subject um, that is guaranteed to come up on your OB shelf and on your step 2 CK examination. So chorioamnionitis is um, an infection of the amniotic fluid. And so the risk factors for that are prolonged rupture of membranes, which is, um, remember, defined as greater than 18 hours, prolonged labor, um, or the, the use of internal monitoring devices can also in, um, lead to um, bacteria going into that amniotic fluid and infecting it. So these are the classic risk factors. In terms of diagnosis, you need the presence of maternal fever plus at least one of the following findings. So fetal tachycardia, greater than 160 per minute, which we had, uterine tenderness, which we also had, um, malodorous, purulent, amniotic fluid or vaginal discharge, and finally, a leukocytosis greater than 15,000. So remember when I mentioned that, you could answer this question without even looking at the fetal heart tracing. Um, the mother had fever, um, there was uterine tenderness, and there was a leukocytosis greater than 15,000. So that was sufficient to make the diagnosis, but um, we also had the additional finding of fetal tachycardia, and that helped us confirm the diagnosis even more. Now, amniocentesis is rarely performed um, because this is a clinical diagnosis. However, if it were to be performed, or if you were to get any of these findings in your question stem, you should know that they are confirmatory. So if you were to um, have a positive amniotic fluid gram stain and see bacteria there, if you were to culture the amniotic fluid and it were to grow um, a certain bacteria, that would also be a positive finding. If the amniotic fluid had low glucose, remember when there are um, bacteria, they consume the glucose, um, similar to when you have low glucose in your CSF or even in your pleural fluid in the setting of a bacterial infection, 
same principle here. Um, and you might also have a white blood cell count that is elevated in the amniotic fluid. So again, this is rarely done. Um, however, it is confirmatory. This is typically a clinical diagnosis, but if you are asked about any findings in the amniotic fluid, you should know which ones of these are consistent with an infection. In terms of treatment, um, you must know the empiric treatment for chorioamnionitis, um, which is going to be ampicillin and gentamicin. And if the pregnant patient is undergoing a C-section, you would also add clindamycin or metronidazole for better anaerobic coverage um, because in these, um, these patients, they typically have more polymicrobial infections. So if they do go on to get a C-section eventually, um, you should also add in your clinda or flagell. So ampicillin, gentamicin, MPR treatment for chorioamnionitis. And important to know also that chorioamnionitis is not an indication for C-section. So if there are no other indications for C-section, um, the woman can proceed with labor, but you should augment the labor with Pitocin because you don't want um, that infection to progress quickly. So you wanna try to get that baby out as quickly as possible. And so the idea here is just um, not keep that baby in any longer than it needs to be and not prolong um, the risk to mom and baby um, any more than we have to. So you will induce labor um, as soon as possible. And if she's already in labor, you're going to augment that labor um, to, to keep it going as quickly as possible. Now, if there are other indications for C-section, then that's what she needs. And that's, um, that's fine for the type of delivery. But if there's no other indication for C-section, chorioamnionitis by itself is not. And you can proceed with um, routine vaginal delivery. Now, there are complications for both mom and baby. So for mom, um, these include uterine acne, postpartum hemorrhage, as well as endometritis, which is a postpartum infection. For the baby, the risks are also high. Um, the worst complication would be fetal death. Um, it's also a risk of preterm birth, neonatal sepsis, or any type of neonatal infection, such as meningitis, um, asphyxia, intraventricular hemorrhage, and some neurologic complications like cerebral palsy. Um, the main one that we talk about most frequently is going to be neonatal sepsis or infection. And so when we're thinking about the risk of infection um, to the baby, if mom had an infection in her amniotic fluid, it makes sense that baby's at increased risk of having early onset neonatal sepsis. So this is a very high yield topic and I would make sure that you're able to recognize the clinical presentation, um, that you can recognize the findings on um, of the amniotic fluid that would be consistent with choreo, that you know the empiric treatment and what type of delivery is indicated, as well as these become familiar with these complications. All right, so that wraps up our question of the week and thanks so much for listening. Thank you.